Hey guys, my name is Jason with Mount Baker Mining and Metals, and this is the video we have all been waiting for. These are those 18 sacks that I pulled out of my new secret mine in Eastern Oregon, and today is the day we're going to get them crushed through the system behind me and figure out how much gold is in them. Now, if you want to review the video where I go underground and get these sacks and you can take a tour of the underground gold mine, I will put that shot right after this one so you can get caught up. If you want to just jump right ahead and see how much gold is in these rocks, I will put a timestamp right up here in the corner so you can jump ahead to where we start crushing and processing this stuff and getting the gold out of it. We're back in Eastern Oregon. We're going to go gold mining back here underground in this old abandoned gold mine. So in a previous video, we were in here, we were taking some samples, and we found a really, really hot spot, really, really high-grade gold. It's averaging 5 to 10 ounces. We got one assay that was over 20 ounces a ton, I think. So we're back. And today our goal is to go down that hole there, back to our high-grade area. And I'm going to knock down as much of that high-grade as I can onto a tarp, get it bagged up, bring it back to the shop, and run it through the system. So let's go check out what we're going to be working on today and see how much we can get. All right, here's our first little obstacle. We got to go down this ladder. Down to the second level here. It's about, I don't know, 15 feet or so. So we'll get down here onto the lower level. And it looks like there was just a heck of a rain event here not too long ago. Because there's a bunch of stuff that's all washed down here. So there's a bunch of water running down these creating little gullies and all this organic matter and junk washed in here. And then here right above us, if you look straight up, oh, there's daylight. So that's where the old miners went to the surface. And we're gonna be working up here today. I'll put a link for a card or whatever up in the corner if you want to check out our first video where we took these samples. But we're going to be working right up here. This was the really, really rich spot. And I've been looking and thinking about this since we were in here. And I don't know if it's going to show up very well, but there's the vein. It's striking more or less east-west. And then I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but I'll try and show you. Up here on the wall, right there, running down that way, is a fault. And it kind of offsets the vein right here. But there's where the vein comes back. And then there's a little hole up to the first level. And that's where we're going to be working. Now, I pointed out that offset fault right in there. Because oftentimes... And more and more what I'm finding is where a vein and a fault intersect, or two veins intersect like that, it becomes very, very rich. And I don't know if that's where the original mineral fluids came up and then they squirted off in this vein, or if there was something happening there. But typically, when these veins are forming, if you get a change in pressure, temperature, or chemistry, Oftentimes the minerals will fall out at that location. And what better place to do that than the intersection of the fault? You can see there's some copper staining here. The owners told me that the copper staining is a really good indication of high grade. He's done a bunch of slab work on this stuff. Up here you can see there's very little copper staining. It's pretty much isolated to this side, the footwall side of the vein. And the vein here is probably about 12 to 16 inches wide across there. We're going to, and it's really nice because I got this big overhang I can work all the way up. I've got a little roto hammer chisel thing. I've got my hammer and chisel. I got a bunch of fun stuff we're going to use today. But I'm going to lay out a tarp down here. And I'm just going to start wailing away on that thing and see how much we can get. Well, I'm disturbing all kinds of wildlife in here. 
There's a bat flying around. Let's see if it'll come back again. And then there's a pack rat sitting right there in that stall. There's bats in here. Hmm. I've got all sorts of tools here today. Got that battery powered roto hammer. I think what I'm gonna use first though is just a good old hammer and chisel. See how much I can knock off of there easily. I'll get worn out pretty quick on that, I'm sure, but give it a shot. See what I can knock off of there. I'm gonna be wearing a respirator for the quartz dust. And there's a bunch of pack rat, we'll call it poop <laughs> for the video <laughs> down here. So I don't wanna be breathing a whole bunch of that stuff. So I'll be all PP'd up and uh, we'll see what we get. We're about 30 seconds into it here and I've already found a huge piece of gold right there and I should have got it in the face when I was sticking in the face but I was so excited to get it out and show you guys but that's a pretty dang nice piece of gold there and then looking up here at the face See if I can get this. Uh, there's kind of gold sprinkled all through it. There's a piece. There's some. There's some more up here. Right up here. I can't. I can't see the camera, so I hope I'm getting it here. But it looks like there's a little swath right, right here, here to here. That's just loaded loaded with gold and and I'm in the copper area where the owner told me to go so I'm just gonna oh boy I'm just gonna start working right in here and uh, there might be a little bit more up in here too a bunch of galena maybe that gray galena but yeah that's that's really, really nice looking stuff. Holy smokes. All right, well, I like the hammer and chisel just cause it's a little more delicate and allow me to, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and pry this piece out right here. I wanna save a bunch of these specimens for the owner. He's coming a little bit later today. Um, but let me work with that hammer and chisel a little bit more and <clears throat> see if we can find some more specimens. Well, I better get some on video here before I <laughs> hand cob all this out of here. Um, right up in here, see the gray? I think that's Galena. I'm finding it right along with that Galena. Here's kind of that, that first strip we were talking about where I saw it all at the beginning. I don't see a whole lot here right now. Um, there might be some right up in there. I don't know if you can see it right there and there maybe. <laughs> Um, but it's breaking up really nice and easy. I'm hardly, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm spending more time looking at it than I am hitting on it. Um, but after, I don't know, five, maybe 10 minutes, I probably got 50 pounds in the ground. <clears throat> I want to work on this big knob here so I can work it all the way back. There's some really good looking stuff back over here, but I don't want to be under there hitting. And this is all kind of ravelly ground in here. And, all these big knockers, I don't want anything to come down on my head, especially as I open up this hole bigger. It, I don't know what's going to happen. So I'm just going to be careful and just kind of not work with anything over my head. The ground up above looks really good and competent. So I'm just going to work this back a little bit. And, but there's, man, there's some really, really good stuff in here. I hope we get a bunch of gold when we run the equipment. Got it. 
Well, I've got quite a bit of vein knocked out of there now. And I'm going to work on getting this big Doniger right here out of there. I don't like that over my head. So I've got, this is the second tarp full. I'm going to put this in sacks. But a lot of nice looking stuff in there. I've got a couple pieces. That's some nice gold on them. If the tarp's working really well, I can just kind of get it all into a nice little pile, get it up. I probably got 75 pounds there. So I'll get this cleaned up, put into a couple sacks, and then we'll come back. I'll knock a bunch of that waste off of there and just put it on the ground. And then I can keep going on that vein. That'll open up that vein a little bit more for me. Everything down has to come up. It all comes up this ladder. Uh, one sack at a time. Well, I got a little ladder in my spot here so I can get up and, and chisel down from the top. And man, that is making a huge difference. Look at the pile of muck I got here. It took me about 15 minutes. I probably got four or five sacks there. And uh, I really got a big old chunk out from the upper section of the vein there. And there's a level above me. And I think what happened is when they were going through and putting in this level above me, uh, their blasts shattered the quartz down about a foot into the foot, uh, no, not the foot wall, but the, the floor of that upper level. And so it made it all real loose and it was super easy chipping. But now I've got this big knob here that uh, is real hard. And I've got this little bottom of around here in the foot wall. I think I may try and take out some of that foot wall and then I've got somewhere I can slab this hard vein into. Um, but I'm going to get all this muck off the floor first and get it bagged up and then see about getting the rest of that big chunk of vein out of there. It's good looking stuff. The vein's really pinching fast up here. It's only about, I don't know, eight inches wide up there. And as you can see underneath, it pinches down. So. Once we get this big chunk out of here, we'll see what the vein's doing and what it looks like. Also, up there, I'm kind of running out of mineralization. So, uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, I dug a little bit around the foot wall, that vein. It goes back in there maybe 8 or 10 inches. And I really don't like to be picking on the walls much because there's a big slab up there that worked its way down and all this is just kind of hanging here but it's on the foot wall I'm not too terribly worried about it uh, so I'm gonna work on this chunk if it was if it was up on the hanging wall you know and hanging over your head like that that big slab that's that's no good um, but now I can try and just kind of slab that that big chunk into that hole that I made I got my tarp cleaned up we got eight bags of muck out of that and uh, that ends up being about 400 pounds. That hole up there that I made is roughly a foot and a half 
deep, two feet long, and about a foot wide or so. Uh, and so I think for 400 pounds, I think that's about three, three and a quarter cubic feet. So we're, we're right around 125 pounds of cubic feet, which I think about what quartz weighs. Um, so anyway, that was, that was kind of an interesting little calculation, but let's get going on this big chunk and see what we can get out of it. Well, it's still pretty hard. It's, I've knocked a little bit off of there, but I'm going to try one of these feather and wedges and there's kind of a natural little seam there. Dan Hurd introduced me to these. Thanks, Dan. He gave me a few as well. Um, so I'm going to try and drill a hole right in here somewhere and put that wedge in like that and see if I can wedge this, this big old knob off this wall. So I'll show you after I get the hole drilled and see if I can video as I hammer that thing down. All right, I got her in there. Let's see if I can do all this at the same time. Kind of... <laughs> I'm kind of perched on the ladder over a hole sideways in a... Anyway, let's see if this works. Well, it broke something up. I'll get my hammer drill and chisel away what I broke up there and... Take a look. Maybe I should have tried to wedge it off that crack. All right, let's try it this way. Well, something happened there. That worked pretty good. I'll do that again. Thank you, Dan. I got my chisel right in the hole. And it's coming. There it nice. Well, there's our vein. Got that big old knob knocked off of there. Got a big old pile of muck here. I got a bag up. And uh, I don't know how many bags I got, but I think I can carry about 20 or so back with me. I got my little pickup today, so I don't want to do a whole lot more work and have bags that I can't take with me. So I'm going to get this bagged up and we'll take inventory of how much muck we got. All right, guys. There's all 18 sacks in the back of the truck. Every single one of those had to come up that ladder through the underground workings up the ladder and then across to the truck. And man, oh man, am I tired. But we're all loaded up, so I'm going to head home. Be sure to subscribe so you can check out part two when I process all this stuff through our equipment. And I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one. So I've got these 18 sacks that have the raw ore in them 
and I'm going to start with putting them through this jaw crusher here. This is a six inch by 10 inch jaw crusher and the ore is fed in this hopper. It'll crush down through these jaws and come out the bottom into a bucket. And once they're all crushed up into buckets, I'll bring them over here and put them down through the hammer mill. The hammer mill is going to take that half inch minus gravel, crush it down to 70% passing 30 mesh and 50% passing 50 mesh. There's a screen in the bottom half of the hammer mill with 0.8 millimeter slots in it. We feed water into the hammer mill through the side of the case and down through the top where the ore gets fed. That creates a really nice slurry and everything stays in there until it can come out those slots down that orange chute into the distributor trough of the shaker table. Once the ore is fed onto the shaker table, it gets evenly distributed through these ports on the distributor trough and all the dense material, primarily the gold and silver and any sulfides fall down in these long grooves in the rubber and all the precious metals and sulfides work their way across the table. Only the heaviest minerals can come up the long grooves, gold, silver, and the heaviest sulfides, such as galena. They'll work up onto the cleaning plane and down this edge of the table into the number one and number two port. As they work their way down the cleaning plane, the water from this water bar washes the less dense material away and back down the cleaning plane towards the grooves and the gold and silver make a really nice clean line that works down into the number one. There's a number three port here on the shaker table. This is where the middlings go. So most of the sulfides will end up here. There's a little aluminum splitter right here that you can adjust left or right and that will cut the middlings from the tailings. The tailings flow down this pipe into this buried tank and the tailings and water settle out here and the water is recycled and repumped back up to the system to the hammer mill and the shaker table for recycling. All right, we got 18 bags, now we got 18 buckets. I weighed four of the buckets and averaged them out by weight and they were 22 and a half kilograms. So right in these 18 buckets, we have roughly 400 kilograms worth of ore we're gonna run through our system. And a lot of you guys have asked me, what happened to the whole turnkey system? You used to have a whole jaw crusher and conveyor belts and all the stuff. I actually had to sell it because there's such a high demand for all this piece of equipment that I've been selling all my demo equipment. So to answer your guys' question, that's where it went. But if you're interested in any of these pieces of equipment, give us a call or shoot us an email. You can find our contact information in the description below. But let's get these samples run and we'll see how much gold we have.
I don't know if you can hear me, but this is really nuggety. Sometimes there's lots of gold on the table, and other times there's not. There's a pretty good little glug of gold right here. And it seems to be associated with the Galena. It's that kind of blue-gray mineral out here in front. And it seems to be that when there's more Galena, there's more gold. And it's all coming down into the number one right here. There's quite a bit of pyrite in it over here. And that's mostly coming into the number two. There's very little sulfides coming down into the number three, a little bit of quartz. And then we got a nice clean cut between the number three and the number four. So it's all, it's all quartz going that way. But yeah, it's real spotty. Some buckets seem to have a lot more gold than others. And we're down to our last five, four or five here. Well, I don't know if you can tell in the dirty water, but I think most of that line is all gold. Going right down into the number one. And that's the best line I've seen all day. Right at the end of the run, that last bucket. There it comes down. Number one. Can you see the pile of gold right there? There's a pretty nice gold line, huh? Look at that going all the way down. That gold is so, so fine. But it runs all the way down. So there's going down to the number one. And that gold just runs all the way up the table. Super, super fine stuff. But we've got some nice gold. Nice gold line. All right, guys, well, the sugar table's finishing up behind me. We're cleaning up and brushing down the table to get all the gold off. And while I'm thinking of it, I want to mention a few things. We assayed it, it assayed about 15 ounces a ton. There is not seven and a half ounces <laughs> in that number one concentrate bucket. So I wanted to set expectations early that, that it's not gonna be a seven and a half ounce pour at the end of this video. And the reason why that might be is there's a couple reasons. One is something called the nugget effect. When you assay for gold, if there's a super, super rich area in the vein and you get a little piece of that, it can throw off the whole assay and kind of skew your results to show way more gold than if you just go in and take the whole vein. So that might be part of it. The other part is, you saw the gold, hopefully in the video, it's super, super fine. We may have a liberation problem. I maybe only liberated 30%, 50%. I'm not really sure, but I've got a, a sample of the tailings coming out of the number four trough, and I'm gonna get those assayed. Usually it takes a couple weeks. So if I don't have the results by the time I post this video, I'll put the results in the description below so you can check out the assay results of the tailings and that'll tell us how much gold we didn't liberate from the rock because I didn't grind it fine enough. The hammer mill can only grind so fine, but I'm working on another machine here. Hopefully in the next six months, I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna grind all these tailings finer and release more gold. The other possibility is there could be some values locked up in the sulfides, not chemically, but sometimes you'll have little grains of gold that get grown around by a grain of pyrite or a grain of galena. 
So there might be quite a bit more value in our number one and number two cons than we can visually see, and that will come out with the smelting process. But let's get the table cleaned off. We'll get our number one and number two concentrates. We'll go smelting down and we'll see how much gold we have. All right, here's our number one concentrates. The jug weighs about 40 grams, 50 or so with the water. So 1,300 grams. And here's the number two, which I don't think I can weigh on this scale. Oh, yeah. It's about four kilograms. So call it roughly five. Five kilograms from 400 kilograms is 100 to one concentration ratio. 80, 85, somewhere in there. Well, here's a look at our gold. Yeah, and that was just kind of a quick and dirty pan. There's some in there. So that's our next step. We'll get this in the furnace and melt it down and see how much gold we have. And then over here in this pan is the, the panning tailings. So I'm gonna smelt that down separate and see how much gold we have in the panning tailings. But there's this gray mineral over here and it's super heavy. I believe it's galena. I panned a lot of it out. But it is very hard to pan. And if we smelt it down and we get just a whole bunch of lead in our button, we'll know that's that lead galena, lead sulfide. Well, what I've done here is I've panned down the number one cons down to a small amount. And the reason is I wanted to see if I can keep the free gold separate from the other number one concentrates. These are the panning tailings. And the idea is to see if most of the gold is in this stuff is free gold, or if there's a significant amount of gold left in the number one panning tailings. I tried to keep as much free gold out of this as possible. And so what we're going to do is smelt them both down separately. If there's a a bunch of gold in here and hardly any in here. We're gonna know that most of our gold in this ore is free and I can just pan it out. If there's half gold in here and half value in here, we're gonna know that there's still a significant amount of gold in the sulfides from the concentrates and we can just smelt them all down together and recover our gold. Here's the enriched number one concentrates that I panned out. I've got 86 grams. I think I've got enough precious metals in here and I think that sulfide is galena. So I've got enough lead in there. I'm not gonna add any lead collector. Here we are all mixed up. I edited the formula a little bit. I've got 40 grams of silica, 120 grams of soda ash, and I added 30 grams of potassium nitrate.
Well, we let the second pour cool down. Let's get this one weighed. It's cooled down enough I can touch it. And it should just pop right off of there. There we go. So there's that. That's from our number one panning concentrates. 24 grams. So that's about three quarters of an ounce. And I can tell you from the assays that we did that this stuff should be about 70% gold and 30% silver, according to the assays. So whatever three quarters of three quarters is, what's that like? Half at 0.55 ounces of gold. And it's definitely yellowish in color, but it's quite white. A very, very light brassy color. So that is less than I was expecting. I was hoping for two or three or four ounces. Um, but let's see what's in that lead that's from the panning tailings of the number one. There might be quite a bit of gold and silver in there as well. Well, this stuff's cooled down a little bit now, but I've noticed since I've started using oxidizer that I get this interesting little layer on top. And so the potassium nitrate that I use must not mix with the slag. And so I get this, this t separation on top of the pour. And that's why you don't see that surface of the sun texture anymore is because this stuff is floating right on top and the surface of the sun texture is underneath. So I thought I'd point that out. I, I have not seen that before, but it's kind of cool to see them separate. But this is cooled down now. So let's, hopefully the lead's not molten at the bottom. Let's see what happens. Lead's still molten. See it here? Splattered out of there. Son of a gun. Well, this is a nightmare. This is exactly what I keep warning everybody about on these videos. I, I took the temperature on the top, and usually when the temperature's below about five or 600 degrees, the lead is solid in the bottom. But I'm wondering if this stuff on the top maybe acts as an insulation layer, and so this cools off faster than the stuff underneath. Let me, let me take the temperature of this stuff right now. So, oh yeah, see that's still 700 degrees. That's way hotter than the melting point of lead. So from now on, I gotta make sure I get this layer off the top so I can get an accurate reading on the temperature. Dang, what a mess. All right, well, we, the good news is we haven't lost anything. So I'll just collect all this lead here, this stuff here. I'll see if I can break off the slag once it cools down and try and recover the lead. Worst, absolute worst comes to worst, we'll just smelt it all back down again and repour it. Holy moly, look at this mess. So I got lead stuck in the inside of the mold. I got lead dripped all down around the outside. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna put it back in the furnace and resmelt it. I uh, I guess I'll pick out whatever I can here. Oh, see, learn from my mistakes. Don't be in a hurry. Let the lead cool down. Well, I got upset with it after I poured it in the cone mold. So I just dunked her in water. It's just been soaking in water about three or four minutes. So everything should be nice and cold. There. That's what you're supposed to get, is a nice solid lead chunk on the bottom. And there's our, there's our slag. No matte layer in there, so that's good. We got a nice uniform piece of lead. I did not add any lead in there, so that is all from the ore itself. So let's figure out how much we got. We started with about a kilogram worth of concentrates. Well, it's all cleaned up and it weighs 500 grams, so about half of the weight of the concentrates was lead. 
and all your gold and silver is going to be in here. It's actually a little bit hard when I when I pound on it. I pound it on a corner here somewhere, and it's a little bit hard. So I'm wondering if we got some copper mixed in with it. But now we got to get rid of. I don't want 500 grams of lead. That that'd take forever to keep all away. So what I'm going to do is show you my new trick on how to get all this lead out. So I'm going to take our lead block and remelt it down. So I'll turn it back on, but it's going to melt pretty quick. Then I'm going to pour it in water and cornflake it. And then I'm going to oxidize all that lead away. So I'm just going to take our lead and pour it in a bucket of water. Uh, drain the water off and there's what it looks like so I'm gonna bring all that out I should have used deeper water because it's kind of clumped together it still has a bunch of surface area but kind of clumped which isn't ideal but we're gonna go with it so let's just scrape all this out into a bin here and you can actually see if you look close it's kind of copper colored, some of it. So again, I think there's some copper in there. We'll get that in there. Keep the water out as best we can. Now what we're gonna do, because we have a huge amount of surface area on the lead, I can add a bunch of oxidizer and oxidize away, or oxidize, the lead and the copper and the base metals, all the junk in there we don't want, and all the precious metals will collect at the bottom, and then we'll have a much smaller button to work with. We don't have to keep hell 500 grams, we might have to keep hell 50, or maybe 20. We'll see what we come up with. I've mixed up our metal. I have 500 grams of potassium nitrate, which is probably way too much, but I'm going to pour the coals to it and try and get all these big chunks oxidized. I've put in about 300 grams of borax, anhydrous borax, and about 100 grams of silica sand. And that's going to absorb all those oxides we're going to make. And hopefully we'll have a precious metal button at the end of our pour here. Oh, it's just not my day today. I have this crucible break right here. A big crack in it. So it leaked all over my furnace. See down there, I got a big puddle of slag down there. Alright, I had it in the water again. We'll see what happens. Oh, a bunch of junk. All right, here we go. Third time's a charm.
There's our button off the bottom of the second pour. Weighs 162 grams. Alright, so there's 1,700 grams of the number two concentrates in there. I'm going to add 340 grams of silica sand, 1,360 grams of soda ash, and 340 grams of potassium nitrate. So it's 20% silica, 80% soda ash, and then an additional 20% potassium nitrate. I had to increase our crucible to the number 20. And I'll do two smelts in there. Well, it's not the prettiest looking butt in the world. On this one, this is the number two concentrates, all the lead and everything. I oxidized as much away, and it looks like there's hardly any lead left in the button when I put it in the cupel. Because it's about the same size. So let's see how much it weighs. There's, it looks like, you can't really see it on the camera, but it looks like there's some slag left around the outside there. So I might have to get that one cleaned up a little bit more, but. Well, there they are, all three buttons. The one on the left is the free gold that I panned out and smelted down the number one panning concentrates. The middle one is the panning tailings from the number one concentrates. And then this nasty looking thing over here on the right is the number two concentrates. And they vary in gold content. This one's the yellowest, so it has the most gold, probably about 70. I don't know if you can tell on camera. It doesn't look like it from what I'm filming, but this one also has a little bit of tinge to yellow, of yellow, so that might be 50% gold. And this one is pretty silvery, and the silver sprouts give it away that it's more gold, or more, more silver than gold. So we have 163 grams. It might be half gold, maybe 60%. So what's that, 80 grams? That's a little over two and a half ounces, I believe, of gold. But what this tells me is I have to do something that I've resisted for years. I'm going to have to make a follow-up video on these three. Parting with nitric acid and purifying the gold. All right, there you have it. My secret gold mine kind of revealed it's gold. We've got 163 grams of precious metals. Hopefully, half or more is gold. And I've got another video to make. So, stay tuned. Be sure to subscribe if you like this one. Because I'm going to get some nitric acid, part the gold and silver, 
And then I'll smelt the gold down separate, recover the silver, and we'll figure out exactly how much gold and silver I have per ton in my new secret gold mine. So thanks for watching, you guys. I hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll see you on the next one.